Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you here this morning um, and to share with you all. Do you know, I was, I was uh, laughing when we sang that hymn, Holy, 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 um, because I remember it so clearly from when I was in primary school, because it was my least favourite hymn of all. Whenever they, it was number three in the hymn book, and whenever they answered, let's turn to hymn number three, there'd be like this sinking feeling <laughs> within my heart. And uh, I just used to think it was really boring. But I think it's because I didn't understand what he was talking about. My eyes were not opened to see the treasure that was in that hymn. And today I'm going to be talking to you uh, about a passage um, where people couldn't, their eyes weren't open to see the treasure that was in front of them. So it just kind of makes me laugh because I think it's a fantastic hymn now, just to <laughs> set the record straight. <laughs> no, no, it was brilliant. Um, last time I spoke, it was Easter Sunday and we had the baptisms and I spoke on um, Isaiah 51 and about one of the great themes in the Bible, which is that we need to come to God. And Isaiah 51 and 52 said this, just to remind you. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? And we also looked at John uh, 6, verse 27, and I, I said it to the people um, that were getting baptised particularly, um, that uh, we should not work for things, uh, that, for, for things that do not satisfy, but we should work for food that endures to eternal life. And um, I want to expand on that today. We're going to be looking at that. And in the same way that come is a massive theme in the whole Bible, um, two of the themes that John has in his book of the Bible are about belief and about life. And by believing, we have life, and you can't have true life without believing. In the, in the synoptics, it talks about... Um, it talks about belief uh, a certain number of times. John has that, uh, the same amount of times that all the three other Gospels talk about belief, John talks about it the same amount of times. And life, if you add up all the times that life is mentioned in all the synoptic Gospels, John doubles it. So they're important themes in the book of John. In fact, he starts when he introduces the gospel with the, the prologue of who Jesus is, he starts with life. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And that's John chapter 1 and verse 4. And he talks in that prologue, the pivotal verse in that uh, prologue that talks about who Jesus is, is John chapter 1 and verse 12. And it's that those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave rights to become the children of God. And the final ver um, reference to life in, in the book of John is in John chapter 20 and verse 31. And he says this, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. So that's what I want to look at today. And I'm going to be reading, it's a relatively long passage, but... I'm sure you can manage to, to concentrate enough. I'm going to be reading John chapter 6 and verses 25 to 40, if we could have that up. Thank you. So if you've got your Bibles, that's fine. If not, you can follow it on the screen. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man has given, will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 
Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe, but you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. That's a cracker of a passage, isn't it? <laughs> Just to put it in its context of when uh, Jesus was saying these things, it was at the time when the Passover was near. Now, the reason that's important is because the Passover re uh, reminded people of what God did for the nation of Israel when he released them from slavery in Egypt. And also, it was about the bread that they ate for 40 years after that release. And that's why the, the people listening to Jesus said, you know, we ate manna for 40 years. And then after, uh, it's after... Jesus had fed the 5,000 people. That's one of the only miracles of Jesus that's actually in all four Gospels, is the feeding of the 5,000. And it's one of the seven signs that John includes to show who Jesus is. And we're going to talk about signs later. So that's the context, the idea that Passover was near, that there'd been the feeding of the 5,000. And it start, it's, not a, it's not a dialogue. Uh, uh, sorry, it is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. Jesus is responding to what people have said to him. And the first thing they say to him, there's five things they say in all. We're, we're going to look at four today. There's five things that they say. And the first thing is, Rabbi, when did you get here? And the reason they can't quite fathom that out is because in between the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus had walked on water, and they didn't know that. So, um, but actually, you, you'd think, when I, when I used to read this, I used to think they were saying, rather than saying, why, when did you get here, it's, it's like they were asking, how did you get here? But actually, they weren't asking that at all, because Jesus' answer is, is not to answer the question, but he talks about their motivation. And he says to them, you've come to me because you're looking for me to feed you again. You want your physical needs met, like I've just fet, met your physical needs. And he says to them, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that enjoys, endures to eternal life. He tells them to look up. He tells them to look beyond the physical and to look up. And that's what signs are in John. They are signs to make us look up. John Piper calls them beams of glory, where something of heaven touches earth. And uh, what Jesus is saying is we don't look at where it's, that beam has touched earth. We need to look up the beam and see the glory. And I like that idea. And I just want you to imagine that you've heard about a really beautiful waterfall. And this waterfall is actually relatively close by. And um, you start talking to your friends about it. And then you decide, you know what? We're going to go on a hike. 
and we're going to go and find this waterfall. This is before GPS on your phones, all right? So just bear with me on this one. I'm using this analogy, right? So we, you all decide we're going to go for this hike. It's, it's relatively near, near but it's, it's, a day, it's going to take you a day to get there and a day to get back. So you all decide you're going to pack up your packed lunches. You pack your loads of waterproofs, because we need them in this weather. You do your packed lunch. You're laden down. You meet up. And you're like, you know where you're heading vaguely, so you head off in the right direction vaguely. And then you come across a signpost which says, waterfall this way. But this signpost is a really, really beautiful signpost. It looks fantastic. And you're all stood there and you're thinking, gosh, I wasn't expecting signposts to look like that. Normally they're just like wooden sticks that stick in the ground and they're faded and you can just about point, uh, work out where they're going. But this is an amazing signpost. It's beautiful, it's cast iron, it's been painted in beautiful colours. And you think, wow! And you spend so long looking at this signpost that you get out your packed lunch and you sit down and you have your packed lunch looking at this signpost. And you, you just, you're just so gobsmacked by this signpost. You think, this is great. And then you realise, oh, gosh, time's really gone on. We'll just have to go home now. <laughs> that would be mad, wouldn't it? That we, spe we, we plan to go to this most beautiful, breathtaking waterfall, and yet we get stuck at the signpost. And that's what Jesus is here as then are doing. They're stuck at the signpost. And if we're honest, sometimes in our Christian lives, we can get stuck at signposts as well. Because Jesus does things for us that are wonderful, and, and we can almost get fixated on the thing that he's done rather than on the person behind what he's done. And so that's what the signs are for in John. They're to tell us to look up and to look at Jesus. Faith needs to be in the one that does the sign, not in what he does. Now, to be fair to the, the people, you know, feeding 5,000 plus, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> you know, but they got stuck on that. They got stuck on that. And so Jesus says, you need to work for food that doesn't spoil, but that food that will endure for eternal life. And so say, they say to him, what must we do to do the works of God? You could paraphrase it, how do we keep God happy? What do we do? And Jesus comes back and he says, don't do, trust. And that really so goes against what we as people are like, aren't we? Because actually most of us are doers. You know, we see a problem, we start out fixing it. You know, we, we, we tend to be doers on the whole. And what Jesus is saying to them is, it's not what you do you need to trust. Jesus said, this is verse 29, the work of God, not works, the work, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Abraham is called the father of all who believe. And we first hear about Abraham um, being made righteous when his name was still Abraham. And it's in Genesis chapter 15, and it's also quoted again in Romans chapter 4. And it's when Jesus, uh, God has promised Abraham that he will be a father to many nations. And Abraham says, he's quite sad because he says... Um, um, but the thing is, I haven't got a child, so I'm only going to be a father through the child of my servant. And God says to him, no, your wife is going to have a child and he will, be the, he will be the one that blesses all people. And it says that Abraham believed God, even though his body was as good as dead. I love that phrase. He was, he, was, he was pushing on 100. Sarah was pushing on 90. They, they were as good as dead. Um, uh, not dead, but as in dead for ch childbearing. They were. <coughs> and it says, but Abraham believed the Lord. He trusted and God credited him as righteousness. Belief is the bedrock 
of life. And, and that's really what I want to focus on today, is that actually belief is the bedrock of life. It's not what we do. It's who we trust. Because the trouble is, works is, is man trusting himself. We can, we can try and do works with really, really good motivations, but at the end of the day, there still can be an element of, look what I've done. And actually, it's self-reliance, whereas belief is man trusting God, us trusting God. It's God-reliance. But the trouble is, is that doing is always easier than believing. Always. But without belief, there is the no, no life. And so belief, it's more than just a mental assent. It's more than just, yeah, I know Jesus claims to be the son of God. It's more than that. It's a trust and it's a reliance. And it implies letting go of ourselves. Belief is the cornerstone to what we do. We do need to do things, but it's the cornerstone. Because if we don't believe, all the, if, and, it, and we don't have that as our cornerstone, everything that we build will be out of whack, won't it? That's what the point of a cornerstone is. You get the cornerstone right, and all the other bits flow correctly from it. If the cornerstone's wrong, chances are the rest of the building isn't going to be good. So belief is reliance. It implies a letting go. It's, a, it's the bedrock, it's the cornerstone for what we do. And I'm going to come back to this next one, but belief pleases the Father. And that's why I think that actually belief, it says, Jesus says that belief is the work of the Father, is that is what pleases him. More than anything we do, belief is what pleases the Father. And I'm going to go back to that uh, later in the, in the sermon. The Jews here, the hearers of Jesus, they were coming to Jesus because they had been fed. So they were coming wanting a kind of a transactional um, interaction with Jesus. We'll come to you, you'll feed us. But Jesus is saying, no, I don't want it to be just transactional, although there are huge amounts of things that Jesus does for us. He wants it to be relational. And earlier in John, he talks to, he talks to the Pharisees and uh, he says to them this. It's in John chapter 5 and it's verses 39 and 40. He says this. Um, actually, I'm going, to read, I'm going to read further than that. He's talking about testimonies. I'm going to read from 36. I have a testimony weighter, weightier than that of John. That's John the Baptist. For the, work that my father, for the works that my father has given me to finish, the, the very works that I am doing, testify that the father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice or seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and to have life. Jesus was saying to them that you're doing everything that you, try, you need to do, but it's you doing it. What I'm saying is, come to me, believe in me. You refuse to come to me. When I was reading um, John Piper, he, he, John Piper writes some really cracking stuff. And he wrote a, a sentence that really stopped me in my tracks when I was reading it. And he said that Jesus did not come to be useful, but to be precious. And I really appreciate the choruses that we've sung today because every single one of them has talked about Jesus being precious, not about what he does for us. He does do huge amounts for, I'm not knocking that at all, but actually Jesus came to be precious to us. We can praise him for what he does, we can value him, 
for what he does. But we need to treasure him. And that's what I was saying about that hymn. I didn't understand the treasure in that hymn. And so what we need to do is we need to value Jesus above all things. And, and since I've been pondering about this, I've been thinking about how I pray. And um, sometimes you catch yourself out praying, don't you? And you do a, sort of a, a very quick sort of, hiya God, I think you're brilliant. Can you do this for me, please? <laughs> And you wonder, I've been wondering, you know, how much of my prayer time and my spending time with God is based on transaction and how much is based on me valuing him? And that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? You know, what percentage do I treat Jesus as precious because he's Jesus and because God sees him as precious? Or do I only value him because he can do things for me? I don't want to be too hard on the, on the people that heard Jesus. I don't want to be hard on you. I'm just trying to prompt some thoughts. Do we value Jesus as precious in himself? So Jesus says to them, you know, the last thing he said to them is, um, they say, what, what must we do to do the works that God desires? And Jesus answers, the work of God to th is this, to believe. And so the third thing they say, say is, Okay, then give us a sign. <laughs> I think if I'd been Jesus in that situation, I'd be going, Dee! you don't get it. But he doesn't. But it is, you know, the very next thing after he's talked about belief, they come back to do something. And that's, that's kind of, I put myself there as well sometimes, you know, that God, talks about things to me and then I'm like yeah yeah that's great that's great and you, you think you've sussed it all and then the next time you're just like yeah but can you just do this can you just show me that and we we're asking for more but I also think it's funny in the context because actually they say to us give us a sign to show that what you're saying is true he just fed 5,000 plus people <laughs> with with someone's packed lunch I do love this story because I always think of my eldest son, Elliot, in this story, you know, that if he was packed lunch, no one would have been getting that fed that day apart from him. <laughs> <laughs> He's got much better now. But as a child, he used to be, share any food? Ooh, ooh, not happening. But when Jesus tries to draw us on so often, we can be, called, we can be stuck in where we are stuck with the sign when he's trying to call us on. So they said, you know, what sign are you going to do? You know, Moses, he fed, he fed a whole nation for 40 years, you know, top that. <laughs> That's basically what they're saying to him. But Jesus corrects their wrong thinking. He says to them, very truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses, it wasn't Moses that fed you. It was God that gave the bread of heaven. He's saying to them, the manna, when you look to the manna, don't look at the manna in itself. Look to the one who provides the manna. He corrects their wrong thinking and he can correct our wrong thinking as well. You know, Jesus, am I stuck on something physical? Am I stuck on doing something? And you want to be saying to me, look up, look up. So when he explains to them that bread comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, their, their next question is then, or their next statement is, well, always give us this bread then, you know, always feed us. But again, he has to correct their wrong thinking. And he says this in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Bible with firsts, um, it's often the first thing, way that something's used in the Bible, the first mention is how it uh, goes through. Like with Abraham, you know, belief, 
leads to righteousness. That goes right the way through the Bible. This is the first of seven I am sayings in John. I'm sure most of you are aware of most of them. But this deals with the most basic needs of human life. You know, for hu physical human life to exist, there has to be food and drink, doesn't there? For spiritual life to exist, there has to be spiritual uh, food and drink. And Jesus is saying, I am the spiritual food and drink that you need for spiritual life. In a sense, it, it um, deals with the most basic thing of, of, that we need as spiritual beings. We need life. Note again, it's come to me, whoever comes to me. It's not about doing, you know, as, as I said in 5 verse 40, it says, yet you refuse to come to me. The scriptures speak about Jesus. The scribes, the Pharisees, they read the scriptures. They poured over them looking for life, but they refused to come to Jesus. Things do not give us life. Jesus gives us life. I know that's a really obvious thing to say, but sometimes our focus just needs readjusting. So I'm not telling you anything today that you don't know already, but I'm kind of hoping that I'm refocusing us on where we should look. So he says, I'm the bread of life that comes down from heaven. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I'm going to skip the fifth comment because that comes after it, um, but that's, that goes into grumbling. But I want to read verse 40, and this is why I say that belief <coughs> pleases the Father, because verse 40 says this, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. We often use the word will as a, as a, as a volition, as a, as a determination, as, as an act of intention. I will do that. This afternoon, I will cut the grass. You know, it's, it's a determination. But um, I'm reliably informed by the Greek scholars. I don't know Greek. You're just reading someone else's opinion, and so I'm passing it on. I'm not claiming it for myself. But the word they use for will here is not so much a volition, uh, a, a, something that comes out of, of a determination, but something that comes out of emotion. So it's based on God's emotion, God's love. So you could say, if you read it like this, for it is my Father's desire that every one who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. I just think that puts a completely different kind of spin on it. That the Father's desire is that we come to Jesus and we believe in Jesus. And that's why I say that when we believe Jesus, we please the Father because we are doing what he desires. I just think that that's lovely. The son is precious to the father. He says when, he, when Jesus was baptised, the father said, this is my beloved son. He is precious to me. I am pleased with him. God the father sees God the son as precious. And so, in a small way, can we imitate that ourselves? Can we see Jesus as precious rather than just as useful? And so that's why I think belief should be such a bedrock to our faith, because that pleases the Father, that we believe Jesus. We believe the claims of Jesus. We believe what he does, but we believe Jesus. And so everything else that we do to the Father is uh, for the Father is built on that belief. And if we don't have that belief, then we've missed it completely. We treasure him. We hold him as precious. 
Now, I look at most people here, and most people here probably do believe in Jesus already. There might be some here that have never made a decision to follow Jesus. The simple answer is you come to him. You come to him and you say, Lord, I want the life that you offer. I want what you offer. It said, uh, when I spoke last time, I spoke about Jesus reconciling the world to God. He died that our sins might be forgiven and that we might be reconciled to God. And there are new Christians here. There are older Christians here. I was talking to one before the service who's been a Christian a lot longer than I have. And sometimes, you know, you think, how can you say anything that's new? Because you add up how many times you've been to church in your life and how many sermons you've heard. That's quite a lot. (laughs) Bring something new. But actually, it's just emphasis and reminders. And so that's what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to remind us, give a little prompt that actually let's not view Jesus in a transactional way, what he does but rather in a relational way and how precious he is to us. And then we can feed our belief because actually belief can die if we don't feed it. Jesus says, I'm I'm the bread. You need to eat the food that I give and you need to drink the, the, the drink that I give you. Be careful what we feed on because actually there's a huge amount out there that actually doesn't believe that Jesus is who he claims to be. You know, I'm not saying you can't watch the television or read books or listen to music, but be careful what you listen to, what you watch, what you read. Be careful the company you keep. Psalm 1, it says, you know, don't stick around with scoffers. (laughs) I can see see people down on the front giving the side eye to each other here. (laughs) You know, it says... Don't walk with scoffers. If someone's scoffing about God, don't, don't, don't stay with them. You know, I, I, that's not saying that we don't have anything to do with people that don't believe, but actually we don't have to stay and listen to them saying that sort of thing. Amen. And, you know, I know that life has difficulties. I, I've, I, am, I feel quite blessed because life's quite calm for me at the minute, and it's, uh, it's lovely. Um, But I know that there are some people that have tremendous difficulties. But even within difficulties, Jesus offers life. And he says, come to me, come to me. And so I just want to emphasise more than anything is is that it's belief in Jesus and holding him is precious. That's the work of God. That's what pleases the Father. That's what I want to do uh, in my life. That's what I want to do in my son's life. Shane, I'm sure with your two boys, that's what you want to see in their life. You want to teach them that Jesus is precious. We want to do that as church. We want to teach each other and remind each other and nurture the fact that Jesus is precious. And hopefully our families that aren't Christians show them that, uh, that Jesus is precious. Ask that God opens their eyes. Ask that God will give them to Jesus because then we know that they're going to be uh, part of the family of God. And so I just read the words of Jesus again in verse 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Amen. Amen.